So welcome to the beginner tournament manager software training. Uh, I want to emphasize the word beginner because this is uh, training will be under the assumption that you are brand new to the tournament manager software or that you are uh, maybe through a new coach or a new event partner, or it may be that you're a veteran EP, but you've also always had someone else do tournament manager, and now you want to see what it's all about yourself. Um, I will say that tournament manager is a great tool that can be used in the classroom too. It doesn't have to just be safe for the events that you host. So um, we're going to get started. So I want to introduce my helpers today. First of all, I'm Shelly Brasher. I'm the Regional Support Manager for Tennessee, Mississippi, and Arkansas. And I've been with the REC Foundation for almost four years and started uh, with coaching and hosting workshops and doing teacher training and then serving as an event partner in my community. So I've been where you are. I've been new just like you are, and it wasn't that long ago. Um, and so it's amazing what uh, like just jumping in both feet can do. So we're glad that you're here today to learn a new tool that will be helpful to you in the future. And I'm juggling a couple of screens, so bear with me as I maybe fumble a little bit. There we go. So my helpers today are Leslie Cruz. She is in the background helping out. She'll be helping with the chat. She is the RSM for Alabama and sort of my sidekick. She, Leslie and I end up serving on a lot of teams together. Uh, Diana Fultz is an RSM for Louisiana and Texas. And then Kim Yi is our newest RSM, who is the RSM for lots of territory, Alaska, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Wyoming, and Washington. She has a lot of geography to cover. Uh, so they will be assisting in the background as needed. Also, because this is a training session, we do want it to be more interactive. So if you want to turn your camera on, if you want to um, unmute yourself and ask a question or tell me to slow down or tell me to speed up or anything like that, please feel free to do that. Uh, this is not easy to do a training like this virtually. Uh, what I like to do, and I'm, I recommend this maybe in the future with your RSM as you're getting started, is that I will have a new event partner, I'll schedule a call with them if they've got an event coming up and they're wanting to learn the software, I'll schedule an event call with them and I'll actually have them share their screen. And then I am on with them and kind of talking through and helping them set it up. So know that we are available to you and that we can help you in that way. Um, you're not alone. Also, we've got some great tools that can help along the way too. So on our next slide, um, it tells you how to get the tournament manager training. So this is something, again, if you're able to actually create an event with us, participate actively, if you can shrink your screen so that you've got the instruction happening on half of the screen, and then you actually doing tournament manager activities alongside, that's going to be the biggest benefit. Uh, on this page, you've got where to find the VEX Tournament Manager software. We have a third party that provides this for us with our request for the features that we want it to have for our teams. And then also the document that is the actual user guide. And um, to be honest, way back when, my first exposure to VEX Tournament Manager was that I downloaded the user guide and me and my students, we just walked through it together in the classroom and it's a great tool. In addition to these tools, the new EP guide that is coming out and the EP certification program, Unit 10 provides the full training for Tournament Manager as well as screenshots. So what we're doing today, you will be able to have that in digital form as well as video form that you will be able to refer to in the future. So know that that we're not kind of leaving you hanging out to dry, that this is not a um, one time and then you're going to be an expert. Um, it's kind of like setting up your grade book each year. I know that, you know, every year in August that IT would show up and we would set up the grade book and percentages for homework and quizzes, et cetera. Then the next year, I never knew how to do it. It's like, okay, tell me again how I'm supposed to do this. And Tournament Manager is a lot like that. If it's only a tool that you're going to be using for one event a year, then you're probably going to want a refresher each year as it comes along. So never hesitate to reach out and ask for assistance with that. So I am going to end the slideshow and uh, 
get into my tournament manager. So when you download tournament manager, minimize that. When you download tournament manager, you're going to have an icon that shows up on your desktop like this. It looks like brackets, like basketball brackets. So in this lull, if you will, take the time to download Tournament Manager. Um, if one of the, uh, Leslie or Diana or Pam, uh, if you wanna put that Tournament Manager link in the chat, if anybody needs it, since I have left the PowerPoint, that might be helpful. If anybody has a question, do not hesitate to ask. So Cam has just posted the VexTN so that you can download Tournament Manager onto your machine. She has posted that in the chat. Thank you, Cam. And we're gonna stall for just a minute. Um, if there's anybody that is that needs a couple of minutes. How about we'll give you three minutes and then we'll go. And if you need more than that, put a message in the chat and we'll wait. Okay, we're ready to go. I'm moving on. If not, put something in the chat and we will slow down. Okay, so we're going to start by creating a new tournament. And this can actually be done prior to your event. Uh, we suggest that you don't set up your electronics and all of that kind of stuff for the very first time, the morning of the event. Uh, make sure that you do your own dress rehearsal and get all of this going and have some experience playing with this beforehand. Uh, I'm going to name my tournament is going to require you to name it first off and so you're going to name it by the date or whatever you can remember i'm just going to name it ep 2020 and notice where it is saving so i'm saving in my downloads folder And voila, we have the welcome screen. So on the welcome screen, this is where you're going to be able to access the user guide. So when you first download the program, it asks you if you also want to save the user guide, and you do, and it will be stored on your computer. But each time that you open it, just in the event that there have been any updates, then you can access the user guide here as well. So you may want to, to have that. If you have a volunteer who is going to come in and run Tournament Manager, um, you want to provide them with the user guide prior to the event, as well as some support to be ready to run the event, and then actually have the user guide printed and next to uh, the tournament manager operator at the desk. That's very helpful at the head table as well. So that's one of the best practice. Okay, so now if you're just using this in a classroom, you're gonna skip this next page, the event code setup. But if this is an actual event where you're going to upload the information, then you do have to complete this. So where do I find this information? Well, I am, I have borrowed an event. I'm going to drag it over from Robot Events. 
Okay. Can everybody see that? Okay, I'm hoping that you can see Robot Events. Um, and this is an event that happened last year that we are going to use as our sample. And it is actually a scrimmage. So anything that we do is not gonna mess anything up. I do want to warn you, do not do this to your events. All right, don't play around with your RE codes because any changes that you make are, if you upload, they are gonna change all of that data. So, uh, don't do this at home. This is just for our practice today. So what you want, this is on the event that an EP had posted, Tennessee Valley Robotics. And on each event, there's going to be an event code. In this case, it's the RIQC-19-9082. And then the TM code, 653-99293. Would one of our moderators put that in the chat, please? Yes, and Shelly, we have a, a quick question for you. Perfect, perfect. Um, did you say to save the folder in VEX Tournament Manager or in my hard drive? It, it's wherever you want to save it. The main thing is take make note of where it's saving. If you want it to save in a specific place, that's great. Um, but what happens a lot of times is people name and click and they don't pay attention to where it's going and then they have trouble finding it later. So Diana just posted the RE code, and so did Leslie, and then uh, Diana has posted the TM code. Now, the RE codes on Robot Events, everybody can see. When any coach goes in to register a team, they can see the RE code. In fact, uh, when you are communicating with your RSM, it, because you say, um, can you help me with something with my event? It, because we have so many events, it's really helpful if you give us the RE code. The tournament manager code, however, is like a password. So that's something that you don't want to share with anybody. You don't want anybody to have access to that because that is where we can actually change scores and change award winners and all of that. So we want to be very careful with that. But this is where you're going to find it when you go in like you're going to edit your event. Okay, so I'm going to move that off the screen. We don't need that anymore. And I'm going to select that this is listed on Robot Events. And then I'm going to put in the event code and the TM code. Oh, John, you're going to get me in trouble. Okay, uh, I, I happen to have the chat window open getting these codes out and I can see that John has posted that last year that he had better luck running on Tournament Manager. No, that's fine. I think it's, it, I'm, I'm so glad you asked this question. He had better luck running Tournament Manager on a Windows computer than on a Mac. Um, and if anybody from Mississippi is listening, uh, is in on the call, then they're laughing at me right now because that is always my first question on a Saturday. If they call, somebody calls and they have a problem, I say, are you on a Mac? It has gotten better. I will say that. But um, there are things that Apple does in their updates that we just don't have control over. And Windows just doesn't seem to do updates that interfere with the software as often as Apple does. Um, so I do recommend that you would use a PC instead of a Mac if possible. Great question. Okay. So what just happened was that all of that data from that event from Robot Events is now in our tournament manager. Beautiful. Now we're doing VEX IQ Challenge, so I'm going to select the VEX IQ Challenge and hit Next. And then uh, you have different options of tournament types, and I 
always, almost always use the medium tournament, even if it's a small tournament, because it gives me a lot more options. These are designed where they, it just gives you fewer things that you can do if you choose one of the school scrimmage or the small tournament. So going with the medium tournament is not gonna make it extremely difficult, but it does give you some more options. So that's what I would recommend that you choose there. Now, in the general setup, First, you're going to name the event. Now, this name came from Robot Events. And if that's okay with you, that is fine with me. The main thing is that when you print out certificates, which is a, a feature that, wrote, that a tournament manager will allow you to do later, you wanna make sure that whatever you have written here is accurate, like make sure you've got capital letters where you want them, make sure that you've used abbreviations or not used abbreviations, because this is what is going to show up on your certificates. Now, the next part is really important. You need a tournament manager password. You can create a random one, which I know that all of my tech folks on the call are going to want to do that because it's going to be one that is really hard to guess. Um, but it's also, I'm old, and it's also really hard for me to remember. So you want to try to have uh, something that maybe not everybody will guess, but um, that you can remember. And if you do have this written on a post-it note or somewhere so that your TM operators have access, make sure that it's well hidden. Uh, any displays that you have in pit areas or behind a screen uh, in the hallway or whatever, if they have the password, they can go in and change scores. So you want to make sure that it's protected. Now, there was a session earlier this week on some of the special tools that Tournament Manager offers, and one was about how to use the web server. So that's what these next uh, are for, these next passwords are for. So basically the way it works is that if you have a, let's say that your judges, they all show up and they all have their own phone or their own tablet. If they can connect to the same network, that's the big if, if they can connect to the same network, that you have tournament manager running on, then they can actually access certain parts of tournament manager to do their job. And if you want them to be able to do that, you need to give them a password. And again, it needs to be something that is not too hard, but it's not too easy for somebody to break in. Now, the judge, what the judges will be able to see is they will be able to look at the skills rankings, They'll be able to look at the qualification rankings at the end of qualification matches, and they will actually be able to enter the teams that are winning particular awards. And so this is really helpful in that it, it takes the need for running this information back and forth to the judging room away, that they will be able to enter that without having to come with a piece of paper to the head table. All of that information is kept secret, but they have access to what they, they want. They also have access to the schedule. So if they are trying to schedule their events, or excuse me, their um, interviews, then they have access to that schedule so that they can do that. Um, inspection, inspection is typically done on paper, but this gives the option of being able to do it on a tablet. And then everything is, once a team is inspected, it automatically comes to the tournament manager software. Now, Scorekeeping, scorekeeping is a little misleading because this is not the way that you will let your scorekeepers put in scores. What this allows them to do is to use a device to stop and start matches and to check in teams. You will have to use the app TM Mobile to do scoring on a tablet and I'll show you how to do that in just a few minutes. But this again allows to start and stop matches at the field and then also to check in teams. So this could be done if you have a tablet at the, at the check-in table or at the inspection table, then that can be done there. Okay, next window, is this a league or not? Now we are not, uh, there was a special session on setting up leagues and basically the way that a league works is it takes a tournament where you have qualification matches, skills runs, and then the finals. And it breaks it out over several different sessions. So checking this box is going to give you that feature where you can break it out over multiple days, but we're setting up a tournament, so we're just going to move on. Now, game configuration. 
Um, this defaulted to squared away because I'm using an event from last year, um, but I want to see the scoring from Rise Above. Now, the reason that all of these old games are listed is because EPs still have all of this old game elements. And so this is great for classroom challenges, for summer camps, uh, and then you can actually have tournament manager set up to use all of these former games. Now, this is the beauty of this. All of the information where teams registered for this event, because we use the RE code and the TM code, have now been put into Tournament Manager. So in this particular event, there were 12 teams that were registered. So all of the event, all of the information about those teams are there. If you had not selected the checkbox on that first page, uh, if you were just doing a classroom, activity or a summer camp activity and you don't have teams that are actually registered, you can click here to generate teams and just give it a number of how many teams that you want. I want, you know, I have 10 teams and then you can go in and name them and the kids can name them, you know, the dragons, the bears, whatever, and there's a way for you to be able to put in that information uh, if you want to, if you want to use it in that way. Now, because this tournament had 12 teams, the number of finals matches automatically defaulted to five because they're looking at, you know, we've got 12 teams. Typically, we're going to have 10 teams. The top 10 teams in IQ are going to move to finals. But you as the event partner uh, can change that if you want to. If you are concerned that, you know, the IQ kids, we have 12 teams, we don't want to teams to be left out and it doesn't add that much more time. It's one more match in the finals to have all 12 teams get to play. Um, then you can go in and change this to six where it really gets a little weird is that if you've got an odd number, let's say that you had 31 teams. Um, if you ran 15 alliances, then 30 of the 31 are going to get to play at the end. And that's a tough, uh, you know, thing to swallow for that one team that gets left out. So uh, depending on the time that you want to use for your finals matches, and then also how you want to have that break with the teams that advance to finals and don't, that's a conversation that you can have with your RSM to, to help if you're not sure how to make that decision. Now, at IQ events, we, uh, we have in some regions, they will have three fields set up, for example, and all three fields are running back to back to back. And so that's what we're going to show you today. So we're in that situation, we're going to have one field set. Moving on, and we'll talk about it in a minute. Now, the one field set is called field control and it automatically defaults to field one and field two. And the example I gave said, wait, we have three fields. So I'm gonna add field three. And when I create the schedule for this with one field set with three fields, again, it's going to run the, the fields back to back to back, one field at a time. We have a lot of regions that like to run all of their fields at the same time. So right now, for example, the schedule might look like field one is gonna start at 10 o'clock, field two will start at 10.04, and field three will start at 10.08. If I wanted to run all three of these together, then I would have on the schedule 10 o'clock on all three of those. And then I would have maybe a little longer, maybe um, 10.06 would be the next three and maybe 10, 12 would be the time for the next three. If you're going to run all of these simultaneously, then you create three field sets with one field each versus one field set with three fields each. Take a minute to get your head around that and then let's see if we have any questions or if anybody else wants to chime in and, and has a better way to explain it, feel free. All right, Dan has this thing where he counts to 10 on our staff meetings. And if nobody said anything, he moves on. So I'm going to use that practice. Okay, 
All right, moving on. All right, so um, field name. I'm sorry, right. Shelly, I wasn't oh, I wasn't fast enough. The well, question, no, does this work on Chromebook? No, you do not want your tournament manager tournament running on a Chromebook. Um, you because the Chromebook is primarily going to be web-based stuff. Now, I, I think, does anybody else know? I don't want to answer wrong. My first instinct was no. This is Cam. Um, I heard in another session from Bill that he also said no. They do not work. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, our well, developers are... caveat is that the other devices that you're using can be. It's not this one that's the, the native one running it. Correct. So in a minute, we're going to talk about setting up displays, and you you absolutely can do that um, with your Chromebooks for you know to as your add-ons. Your main computer, uh, and again along the lines of what John was asking earlier about you know that he has better luck working on a Windows-based computer um, versus a Mac. Uh, I know that as a classroom teacher, I inherited the laptop cart after they replaced them with new laptops. So my classroom had all the old, old, old dinosaur machines. And, you know, we're trying to run them off of those and that did not go well. So you really do want to make sure that your main machine that's running tournament manager is very reliable and up to date. Um, I wanted to uh, insert here about making some money. So when kids get their schedules and they see what time that they're going to be playing, they see on the schedule field one, field two, field three. But what you could do is name a field the Papa John's field. And then we can just remove field three because Papa John's apparently gave us some money in order to name a field after them. And within the software, you'll be able to print signs to go on the field that will have the name of whatever you put here. And it will also have the REC and the VEX logos on it. So it looks very professional. Um, I bring up Papa John's in particular because I had a local team in Mississippi where Papa John's did not give them any money, but they gave them all of the pizza in the concession stand. So everything that they made from selling that pizza, they got to keep as their profit. So they named one of their fields the Papa John's field. Um, so this is a great way to recognize sponsors and strongly encourage just what we do at the World Championship, where we'll have a Google field and an Amazon field and, uh, you know, Autodesk, and we recognize our sponsors that way. Okay, skills challenge fields. This, again, is another variation depending on how you want to set up your event. In some tournaments, they will have a skills field that is designated that opens early in the morning and stays open until the beginning of the finals matches. And students can, teams can come and go as they please to access the field. If that's the case, then this is where you're going to put in how many of these skills, skills challenge fields are dedicated. Now, there are other events that don't have a separate field that runs skills. Instead, if they have three fields, let's say, that they're going to use for the tournament, but the tournament is not going to start matches and head-to-head uh, -head matches until 10 o'clock, then they may have skills open from 8 to 10 on all three of those fields. And then at the lunch break, they'll put skills on those three fields, and then they may open them again for another hour in the afternoon. So it just depends on how many resources that you have. Um, also, all of these variations that I'm giving you, whether it's field sets and sets uh, the fields running simultaneously or back to back, dedicated skills challenge fields. All of those are going to affect the number of volunteers that you're going to need to man those positions. Um, so again, that's in considering if you're a brand new event partner, those are things that you want to work with your RSM in order to make sure that you've got the staffing to cover the model that you want. Now, number one strong suggestion, before you are an event partner for an event, surely you've been to some events as a coach or you've, as a volunteer. You've seen events before. Take from those events what you liked and what you didn't like and then make your event better. 
So that's the best advice that I could give there. But we're gonna, for the, our example, we're going to have one dedicated skills field that's happening over there. So that means that we have four fields total. We've got three that are being used for competition. We have the one that's dedicated for skills. And then uh, this defaults, as you see, the maximum skills challenge to three, and you can't change that. So this means that each team is going to be given the opportunity to run up to three driver skills and up to three uh, programming skills, and then they're done. The tournament manager software, if they come up for a fourth run, is going to have is going to say that they're done. They've already used all of their their times, so it will warn you of that. Um, question on the chat? We want to do if is from Julie. It says if we plan to run a skills only event. Do we set up build sets or can we just set skills fields? Yeah, you can just let it default to the one field and the two. You're not going to use those fields. And then on this screen, um, so on the previous window where we set up build sets, that's going to determine our schedule when we create matches. Well, at a skills only event, you're not going to create matches. So it doesn't matter. And so on the so you can just let it default to what it goes to automatically, which is that one field set and two fields. And then when you get to this one, you can uh, designate how many skills challenge fields that you have. Um, or you can not designate. Here you can leave this at zero, and then on the other screen have however many fields that you have set up. And then I'll show you there's a little checkbox when we get to choosing the field sets that we're going to work with. If you're doing skills only, you can select the field that you want. So actually, you can do it either way. Now that I think about it, that was a good question. OK, so the next part, you're going to set up your pit displays. So these are displays that are going to be elsewhere. Now, if you're running a very simple tournament, really all you need is one display. You have like your main computer. You've got a projector and a screen that the audience can see. And then the person who's sitting at the tournament manager computer can toggle between the different screens to show a variety of information. Now. If you have the luxury of having a, another screen set up where you can have either the uh, ranking showing or the schedule showing, or I'll pull down this list, there's a lot of different options. The schedule, you can have the inspection showing status so that teams can see and everybody can see who has passed inspection and who hasn't. Um, then you can set up all of these different options for other displays, for ancillary displays. Or you can just leave it at the one, and then at that one, you can go in and change it to all of these. So again, there's a lot of flexibility. I've seen where some people will go in and they'll actually add like this. They'll add all of them. We don't do a lot of selection in IQ or elimination brackets, so I'm skipping that. Um, skills rankings. So you can add whatever that you want um, to have a quick uh, way to be able to toggle your displays. All right, Shelly, if you have a minute, we have another. Sure. It says, don't believe there is a Chromebook version of Tournament Manager, but if you want to run something like crossover, you can get the Windows version running on Chrome without easy USB support. So not really a question, just a... Okay, no, great. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I, I, I know that we did do that, uh, something similar. We used Parallels on the Mac computers to be able to run in a Windows environment. So that sounds like it's a similar um, way of adapting. Okay, now this is the fun part. This is where we're gonna set up our schedule. And this uh, 
I, I caution you to give yourself plenty of time. It's always better to run ahead of schedule than behind schedule because that stresses everybody out trying to catch up. And each year, the match cycle time is going to fluctuate and we really don't have a good idea of how what the match cycle time should be until after we've had some events. So again, that's an RSM question that can kind of give you some uh, some guidance on that or on the Facebook groups, they can give you some guidance on that. So our new schedule block. So here we're going to start a tournament. We'll say that we're setting this up in advance and that this one is, is already set for the that date from robot events that pulled it in and that we want it to start at 10 o'clock and we want to run until 11.30. And I'm just making stuff up. You can work with whatever agenda works for you, but we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of this. All right, so 10 o'clock to 11.30. Um, this is an IQ game and we are running the fields back to back to back. So in that format, as once one field finishes and the head ref tells the scorekeeper to go ahead and score it, they move on and start the next one. So we're not going to need a six minute cycle time. So maybe do like four minutes. That's still kind of high. But I'll tell you why I chose that here in a minute. These are going to be qualification matches. And uh, you see how I've got 203 matches? That's because I've got us going until 1130 p.m. I don't want to do that. Okay, that makes me feel better. All right, so now I'm at 23 matches happening before lunch. And the number of matches per team is a little less than four. Now in IQ, who can answer on the chat why four is the magic number in IQ? Not an REC person. We need Jeopardy music. Woo woo, Casey wins, Casey wins. We have no prizes, we're a nonprofit. But Casey wins, yes, because you after the fourth match, the lowest score is dropped. So we are we want to make sure that when we are scheduling matches that we try to get in four, eight, twelve, um, so that every time there's a fourth match, then they're dropping the lowest score. All right, so the way I have it right now. Everybody's going to get in a little less than four right before lunch, and I'm going to add that segment. Now, my plan is to take lunch break from 11.30 to 12.30, because during that time, judges are going to be interviewing teams probably, kids are going to be running skills, so, um, and especially if you're not serving concessions, you know, that gives, it gives parents time to run and get lunch and bring it back to the kids, all kinds of reasons to schedule in that lunch break. So we're going to start back at 1230 and go until two o'clock, let's say. Let's just see what happens. We're going to play around with this and see what happens. So from 1230 to two o'clock, qualification matches. All right, now we've got another almost four. And but I tell you what happens at lunchtime when your referees and all of your queuing staff come back after lunch, they're not rookies anymore. And they can run these matches boom, 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 because they have fallen into this groove and the teams have fallen into that groove too. So we could actually reduce this time and maybe get in some more. So now we had almost four matches here. We're going to get in five matches by doing it this way. And now we've got it where every team is getting, do you see where our pointer is? Every team is getting eight matches, so they will drop their two lowest scores. And I think that's a pretty good event. Now, if we look on here, the number of matches per team, we see that there's some that we're actually getting almost nine. Um, what's going to happen is that when you print out your schedule, the teams that are playing their ninth match is going to have an asterisk beside it, and that ninth match is not going to count. Only, their, only eight of their matches are going to count. And so you may want to adjust this time so that that doesn't happen. And you can do that by double clicking. And that gives you the option to edit. 
and we can go back and we can adjust this time a little bit so that this is three instead of 3.8. So we want to make the matches the schedule a little bit longer. Okay, getting close. Make me go to five. Ta da! And I'm there. But again, if you're off just a little bit, it's not that not that big of a problem. All right. Moving on. All right. So questions about the schedule. What we can see is that we're going to have a total of 48 matches for the day, and then we set up previously that. We, would, we were going to have six matches in the finals because we're going to let all 12 teams participate in the finals. Okay, now there are two schools of thought on this next one. So one is go ahead and create the qualification matches and hope for the best. The other one is don't do this yet because if a team doesn't show up, you're going to have to do it all again. Um, your call, uh, flip a coin. Uh, we're going to go ahead and create qualification matches here, but I will show you when we get into the program where you can do it at a later time. But when, I'm going to hit create qualification matches, and it shows that we're going to have 48 matches, eight per team. Sounds good. Now, another thing that happened when I put in that RE code and that TM code is that the event partner had put in what awards that they were planning to give. And so those are automatically checked. So this event partner was going to give the, the excellence award, the two tournament champions, the tournament champion second place. Um, they're giving robot skills champion. They're giving design. Um, any of these awards, the judges award, uh, if you get your EP trophy pack, then it's going to have certain awards in it, but you can give other awards and tournament manager will print out the certificates for those. Um, and I'll show you where to find that. So some, you know, some people, especially at a large tournament, you want to recognize more than just your best notebook. You may want to recognize your top few notebooks, um, and there are ways to do that but this will automatically come in from robot events. If you make a change here and you don't make a change on your posting on robot events, when you go to finalize, it won't let you because these two are no longer in sync. So it's important to note that if you do put an additional award here or you make changes to your awards during the day, I mean, it may be that a ju the judges decide that nobody really met the qualifications for an excellence winner. And then you're going to have to work with your RSM to adjust that on robot events so that you can actually upload your scores from Tournament Manager when it's all said and done. Okay, this is another page. This is the last one. This is another one that it's a little bit controversial because we have a fantastic app called the VIQC Hub. And on it, it's, it's a way for the, anyone who's not at the event to be able to see what's going on. They're able to see the schedule. They're able to see the outcomes of the matches. And this is how you're publishing that to the IQ, the VIQC Web Hub. And you may not want that. So if you are creating this tournament, a week in advance 
and you went ahead and created your matches, since that might change, you don't want that published. So you won't check these until you know that everybody is checked in, everybody is inspected, and the tournament is ready to roll. And then finish. And wait. There it is. Okay, so now you are in Tournament Manager and your event is all set up. If you click on the little plus sign that's next to the qualification folder, you'll see that there are all of your matches. If you click on qualification match one, then you can look down here and see that team one is 38474D and team two for that match is 94406A. So all of your qualification matches have been created. Voila. Um, if you look over at skills challenges in the pull down menu, you'll see that you'll be able to, as teams come up to the skills field, you'll select what team is there. You'll select if they're doing driver or programming and you'll be able to run their match and score their match accordingly. And then as that happens, then those scores are going to show up here, whether they're driving or programming, and then overall rankings for the teams that are participating in skills, in that schedule, uh, um, in that, uh, those, on that day. You'll be able to see the schedule here. Um, you'll be able to see the awards that have been selected. These are the awards that are selected. And so once everything is all said and done, you'll be able to enter the winners of those awards. You have slides that you can create for a presentation. You can either make your own slides that you can present during an opening ceremony, or you can create slides for your awards ceremony. We'll look at that in just a minute. I'm kind of jumping around. Um, again, on these lower tabs, you can see the rankings. Right now, there aren't any. Um, the team list, and this is where you can, if you were just putting in that you had 10 teams at a camp, you, that you could name them dragons and bears, et cetera. That's where you have the ability to make those kinds of changes. All right, so uh, next we're just, we're just gonna walk through the menus to show you what's here. And then we will look at, now that we have set up a tournament, now we're transitioning and getting ready to actually run one. All right, so let's just familiarize you with everything that is here. So you've got the save a copy that's really important. And with my students at school, I always tell them save early and save often. Um, and that is true here as well. So save, save, save so that along the way that you're, if, if anything happens, then you're not going to lose anything. Um, Uploading results is what you're going to do at the very end. Um, save log files is something that occasionally, if you're having some issues and we're on the phone and we can't figure it out, we'll ask you to save log files and send it to us because we can have IT look at it and they can tell what's going on in the background and they can fix the problem. Uh, so if it's not something that is evident to us to, to fix, then that is where we can get that information. After the qualification matches are complete, then you'll create the finals matches. Um, so here are, this is everything under tools. This is awesome. So team check-in, as teams report in, then you can check them in so that you know that they have all arrived and make sure that your uh, schedule is going to work. If a team doesn't check in, then you'll need to rerun the schedule in order to to uh, make sure that that team that didn't show up is not in the mix. Also under tools, you have inspection and you can list as each team is inspected, whether they're partially complete or if they've passed, the inspector can make notes. And then as they pass inspection, they go away so then here you can see uh, which ones that you have left to go. And so forth until everybody has passed inspection.
still under tools. You have announcements. Um, this is kind of a cool feature. Uh, you can actually type in messages and put them on a schedule, and these are going to appear like a ticker across the bottom of your main screen, your audience display screen. So I can say that um, um, concessions will open at 11. Or we are running ahead of schedule, so be at the field early. Something like that, and then tell it when that you want it to stop. Text messages are not often used at local events. We use them at World Championship, but if you have a way of getting uh, the teams to give you a text, a uh, cell phone number during the day, you can actually set this up where the text messages, uh, they will send them a text message of what the schedule is so that they will know that they have like 20 minutes until their next match or something, it's pretty cool. Uh, but usually you only see those at the more advanced or the larger events. Now. Mobile devices. Um, this is where you're going to use the scoring. And I don't know if you've got your your um, camera set up where you can see me or not. I don't, so I can't see me. Um, let me see if I can move something so that I can make sure that I'm showing this in the camera. Okay, so there is an app that is TM Mobile. And you can download it from the App Store or from Marketplace. And this is how you keep score. So I mentioned on the other that on when we were putting in passwords for scorekeeping, that it only allows you to put in the uh, stop or to start and stop matches as well as checking in teams using the web server, but using the tablet, then you can actually score field side. And this is a huge relief to whoever is manning your computer at the head table, because then all they have to do at the head table is to, is to monitor the audience displays um, and maybe start and stop matches. So it really takes a lot of the work off of that. But the way that it works is that, uh, let me back off of this a minute and show a couple of steps. Under the help menu, go to get IP address. And I happen to have two. I had to try both of them to see which one worked. So it turned out that this one worked, the 10.00114. So when I first opened TM Mobile, it came up and it said that I wasn't connected. So I went into settings on my iPad and I typed in this IP address. Now it comes up and it tells me that my tablet is not authorized. That's because I don't want anybody in the stands to be able to do this. But, so on this screen, if you can see, I know it's little, it says that um, this device has not been authorized yet. To authorize this device, enter the following code in Tournament Manager 52. So this is where I go under Mobile Devices, Tools, Mobile Devices, and I type in the code 52, and I authorize the device. Now, I hit continue, and when I choose match scoring, this is when I say a prayer, please work, please work, please work. There are all of my matches. And I click on qualification match number one, and I've got the scoring, and I just type in what they did, and then I hit send, and the person at the table confirms that they are receiving the score and that it looks like it's a feasible score and we move on to the next match. So this allows the scorekeeping to happen at the field side. Now you can do it manually and have the referee scorekeepers do the scoring on paper and then they can run it to the, to the tournament manager operator and they can input the scores manually, but using a tablet is a huge time saver. It really makes it easy on everybody. They're able to show the kids the scores at the field live. This is what's going to be posted. And then they hit the enter button and done, discussion over.
And again, that is TM Mobile uh, that is available on the App Store and that's free um, and can be used on pretty much any device, I believe. Okay, again in tools, uh, elimination final matching, uh, when we get ready to create the final smatches, check for illegal match scores. I don't think that's used very often, uh, but it could be if there was a question that a score got put in incorrectly. You don't wanna run the wizard. So everything below this line right here is the danger zone. Don't go in the danger zone unless you really wanna do that. If you run the wizard, it's gonna go back to where we were at the very beginning of this session and we start over and you, there's no going back. You can regenerate the match schedule. So this is important if a team doesn't show up. We already made the match schedule. If a team doesn't show up or a team doesn't pass inspection, then we're going to need to rerun it. And this is where you'll do that. But the good part is that it'll only take you to that part of the wizard. It won't make you start over with everything. Now, options. This is actually under the danger zone line, but a great tool. This is where it is sort of a modified version of the wizard. And it lets you go in and change certain things that you need to do without having to start over and it's not gonna mess up everything else. So we've got our, uh, we can see the page where we entered our event code. Um, we can look at the passwords because it's like, oh my gosh, I did this on Monday. I don't remember what password I put on because it's Saturday. Um, you can look at, oh yeah, um, we had, eight qualification matches, okay, so we want eight to count. Now, where this is important is let's say that you got very ambitious and you set it up that you were going to play 12 matches and the power went out. And now the power's back on and you're two hours behind and you're like, yeah, we're not gonna get all of these in. So I need to reduce this number. You can reduce this number in case of emergency. And then you can just let the audience and the teams know that you're only playing to a certain match. So let me show you, if I reduce this number to six, because something happened. And then I go back to my scoring window. Move some things so I can close out of that. 